My name is Ralph Price, and I'm the preacher for the Streetsboro Church of Christ. It's my honor to be able to be here and speak with you today. I've known uh, David Kinney for about 13 years. He used to be a member at the Streetsboro Church of Christ, where I am the preacher. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. This past summer, a movie came out, and it's based on a series of books. The movie is called Left Behind. And it's based on the books that were written by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins that deal with the idea of things that are going to occur at the end of time. Now, these men wrote this book and it has become very popular with many people. And this movie, I am told, though I have not seen it, focuses on the idea of the rapture. Maybe you've heard people talk about that before. Uh, this is the idea that uh, is taught by many in the religious world that when Jesus returns, that he is going to do so in a secret and quiet way and that he's going to take with him to heaven those who have lived righteously in this life. And that when he takes those who are righteous with him to heaven, everybody else is going to be left behind. Now this, this idea of the rapture is part of a, a larger set of beliefs that is often referred to as premillennialism, which is a belief that Jesus is going to come back before he sets up an earthly kingdom here on earth in Jerusalem. The question that I want to answer and that I want to ask is, are these beliefs true? Are they in accordance with what is taught in the scriptures. And so first of all, what I want to do is briefly answer the question, what exactly is the doctrine of the rapture? Well, as has already been alluded to, the rapture is the belief that when Jesus returns, he's going to do so quietly. And that at such time, he's going to take the righteous up to heaven to be with him for a period of time. And that these righteous people who are taken by Jesus, they're going to be caught up in the clouds with the Lord. And, and that's what the word rapture means. It means to be caught up. And that the reason Jesus then is going to take these people, we are told, is because there is going to come a period of tribulation on the earth for about seven years. And Jesus wants to spare his people from that tribulation. And therefore, he's taking them with him to heaven for seven years. And then he will return with them at a later time. This doctrine is nowhere taught in the scriptures. Unfortunately, it comes from a series of scriptures that have really been misapplied and misused. I recently just did a search in, on the internet and, and looked for the arguments in favor of the doctrine of the rapture, and I want to share with you the three passages that I came across most often that individuals use to teach that there is going to be a rapture, as we've discussed. And the first one is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning of verse 15. In this, Paul writes, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. You see there in verse 17 that it says, We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Do we deny that faithful children of God, when Jesus comes back, are going to Meet him in the air? No, we don't deny it. It is very plainly taught in the scriptures. And yet what we need to understand is that is not the only thing that's going to happen at the end of time when Jesus returns. 
you see the premillennial doctrine and the doctrine of the rapture says that yes, the righteous are going to be raised to be with the Lord and everybody else is going to be left behind. But that is not what this scripture teaches. It is teaching that the righteous will be caught up with the Lord, but it is not saying that nothing else will occur at that time. And we're going to talk about what else is going to occur at, toward the end of this lesson. Then if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is another one of the passages that is used. Verses 51 and 52 tell us, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice there that Paul says we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We are told by some that this is a reference to the rapture and how uh, individuals will be changed before they go to meet the Lord. Well, yes, Paul is talking about individuals who are going to be changed. And yes, the scripture does teach that those who are alive when Jesus returns, they're going to be changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. But again, that's not all that's going to happen when Jesus returns. There is more to it that we need to remember. And then finally, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Here Luke records for us, Now when he had spoken these things, the he there is referring to Jesus. While they watched, the they is the disciples, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Does this passage teach that when the Lord returns, he will do so by descending from the sky? Absolutely, it teaches that. But again, that doesn't mean that that's all that's going to happen when Jesus returns. We get ourselves into so much trouble when we grab verses here and there and apply them out of context and do not remember the overall teachings of the Scripture. These passages, these three passages that we have noted, do make mention of things that will occur at the end of time. But the doctrine of the rapture, as is taught in these books and in these movies that were uh, written by Tim LaHaye, is nowhere taught in the scripture. What I want to do now is I want to look basically at three reasons that we can know that the rapture, as is taught in this movie and in these books, will not occur. Number one, we can know that the rapture will not occur in such a way because the Bible teaches, yea, Jesus teaches, that when he comes back, the dead who are both good and evil will be resurrected. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said the following, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Notice, if you would, that in this passage, Jesus says both the good and the wicked are going to be raised at the same hour. Now, some might say to you, well, you know, hour is a generic term. It doesn't mean literally an hour, but I would suggest to you that it certainly doesn't mean a thousand and seven years which is what the premillennial doctrine teaches, that the good will be raised at the rapture when Jesus comes, and then after the thousand-year reign and the seven-year tribulation, then the wicked will be raised at the end of time and go to judgment. Jesus here says in John 5 that the good and the evil would be resurrected in the same hour. There's not going to be a great amount of time between the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Number two... And we need to remember that this doctrine of the rapture goes hand in hand with the overall teaching of premillennialism. That the idea that Jesus is going to reign one day and he's going to reign for a thousand years in the city of Jerusalem on the throne of David. 
The second reason we can know that the rapture is not going to occur is because the Bible never says that Jesus will set foot on earth again. Notice, if you would, again, the passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and in verse 17, it says there, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. There's not a single word in that verse that implies that Jesus is ever going to set foot on the earth again. We need to realize that if Jesus were to reign on the earth, it would be a contradiction of Scripture, and certainly that is not going to occur. Jesus was a descendant of a man called Jeconiah. He's also called Coniah in the Scriptures. Now, Jeconiah was one of the final kings of Judah, and a prophecy was made about Coniah and about his descendants in the book of Jeremiah, and I want to read that to you. In Jeremiah chapter 22, beginning of verse 28, it says, Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for, now listen to this, none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. What is this passage saying? This passage is saying that none of the descendants of Jeconiah would ever reign in the city of Jerusalem. None of them would ever prosper sitting on the throne of Judah and rule, throne of David, excuse me, and ruling any more in Judah. Why is that important? It's important because in Matthew 1, verse 11, in the genealogies there, that section that everybody likes to skip over when they're reading the book of Matthew, we read that one of Jesus' uh, uh, ancestors was Jeconiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah. Jeconiah is in Jesus' family tree. What does that tell me? It tells me that Jesus cannot rule on the earth, in Judah, on the throne of David. To do such would be to contradict that prophecy that was uttered by Jeremiah and recorded in the Scripture. You know, the truth is that Jesus' kingdom already exists. He is already reigning in His kingdom. You remember we read the passage in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus ascended, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, he has a vision. And in this vision, it's as if he is up in heaven watching Jesus ascend with the, uh, in the clouds. And listen to what he says in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and brought him near, they brought him near before him, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Did you notice there that Daniel says that Jesus was given his kingdom when he ascended up to the Father? And we read about that ascension in Acts chapter 1. It's interesting to note then that after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, when the Bible talks about the kingdom, it always says that the kingdom is in existence. It's here. It is, it is real. It is tangible. You can be part of that kingdom. Remember, before Jesus died on the cross, the, the message was a little bit different. The message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But when Jesus ascended up to the Father, he was given his kingdom, and it exists now. One verse out of many that we could note that points this out is found in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. It says there, He, God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Is Jesus still waiting to come and establish his kingdom to reign over uh, his people at the end of time? Absolutely not. He's already reigning over his kingdom. 
And those who are faithful Christians and servants of the Lord are in that kingdom. We've been put into it. So the second reason we can know the rapture will not occur is because the overall premise, the idea that Jesus is going to come back and rule in a kingdom in Jerusalem is false. His kingdom is in existence now and he's ruling over it now. Finally, number three, another very simple proof that the rapture, as is described in these books and taught in premillennialism, is false, is the fact that they say when Jesus returns, he's going to do so secretly or quietly. Notice again, if you would, the passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 16 there, we read, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Notice there the words that are used to describe the noise when Jesus comes back. It says that he will descend with a shout. It talks about that shout coming from the voice of an archangel. And the passage makes reference to the trumpet of God. You know, if I were trying to write a verse that, dis that described a secret, a quiet coming by Jesus, this is hardly the way that I would choose to describe that coming. One person has said, and I think rightly so, that 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16 is the noisiest verse in the Bible. Jesus is not going to make his return a secret. It's not going to happen without our knowledge, yea, without the knowledge of everybody who is on the earth at that time. Notice also how Peter describes the events that will occur or that will occur when Jesus returns. Second Peter 3 and verse 10. Peter says, "But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night." Now he's talking about when the Lord returns, in which the heavens will pass away with what? with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Notice there, that passage tells us the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It will be unexpected. And it tells us that the heavens will pass away with what? With a great noise. Can you imagine if our heavens passed away, if the atmosphere of the earth goes away, it's going to make a great noise. I think that I would be aware of that if our heavens were to pass away. But not only that, it says the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And so it's not a secret. It's not going to be a surprise when the Lord comes back because he's going to make himself known. Finally, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 here a statement is made by, by John when he says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Again, making reference to the fact that Jesus will descend. We've seen that in 1 Thessalonians 4 and also in Acts chapter 1. The Lord himself will descend, or excuse me, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Notice here that John says that when the Lord comes with the cloud, that every eye will see him. But not only that, did you also catch where he says, even those who pierced him will see him when he returns. What does that tell me? That tells me that when Jesus returns, all who are living are going to see him and know that he's returning. But it also tells me that even those who are dead, will be aware of his return because even those who pierced him while he hung on the cross will know that he is returned. For these three reasons, we can know that the doctrine of the rapture is false. Yes, we're going to ascend the righteous will to be with the Lord forever, but it's not just the righteous that are going to be resurrected. James or John chapter 5, Jesus tells us that the good and the evil will be re resurrected at the same time. Number two, the rapture is false because the Bible never teaches that Jesus is going to reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. To do so would be a contradiction of Scripture. And number three, 
The rapture, as is taught by premillennialism and in the books and movies by uh, Tim LaHaye, uh, is false because when Jesus returns, it's not going to be in secret. It's going to be known by all. Well, briefly, in the time that we have left, let's answer the question, well, what does the Bible teach about the events that will occur when Jesus returns? Now, we've already looked at all the passages. We're just sort of going to put them all together now and, and draw a picture of what will happen when the Lord returns. First of all, and mark this down, when Jesus returns, it's going to be at an unexpected time. Friend, if anybody ever tells you that they know when Jesus is going to return, you can immediately mark that person off of your list as somebody on whom you can rely. Because Jesus taught us that we cannot know the day that he is going to return. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 24, he, he made reference to his coming and says, Of that day and hour no one knows, only my Father in heaven. Implying that at that time he didn't even know when he was going to return. So it's going to occur at an unexpected time. Don't listen when people tell you that they know it's coming up, that it'll occur on such and such a date. They don't know that. But number two, when he comes back, we will all know it. It's not going to be in secret. His coming will be announced with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. We'll also be aware of his return because the heavens will pass away with great noise, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. And all eyes will see him, even those who pierced him, Revelation 1 and verse 7. When he comes, not only will all be aware, but when he comes, all the dead will be resurrected, John 5, 28 and 29. It's going to occur in the same hour. And at that time, the righteous will then go to meet the Lord in the air and thus ever be with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 again, verses 15 to 17. It tells us that the dead will be resurrected and rise to meet him first. That's what, that's what Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4, that the dead would rise to meet him first. But then he said, those who are alive and remain will then rise to meet him. And that's what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about. It's saying that those who are alive when Jesus returns will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and then go to be with him. And then finally, when the Lord returns, we also can know that the heaven and the earth will be destroyed from 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. There's no promise of an earthly kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years. He's already reigning over his kingdom, and Christians make up that kingdom today. In conclusion, will the Lord return one day? Absolutely. We don't know when that day is going to be, and when he comes, there will be no second chances. You know, premillennialism teaches that when Jesus comes and takes the righteous, that if, if you are left behind, you still have another chance to repent. And if you don't take the mark of the beast, that you'll be allowed to enter into heaven. But the Bible teaches when the Lord returns, the door is shut. There are no second chances. Therefore, we need to be prepared now. When Jesus comes, it's to be our judge. And I want to conclude with 2 Peter 3, Beginning at verse 11, here Peter had just told us that the earth was going to be destroyed when the Lord returns. And then he says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Since all these things are going to pass away, we need to be prepared for Jesus' return. Thank you. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. 
As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Yeah.